Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Silva. Thank you for joining me. I'm a board certified psychiatrist, expert psychopharmacologist with almost 30 years experience diagnosing and treating mental illness. And this is my channel. Welcome. I do want to mention my private online academy, not on emptymind.thinkific.com. Please check that out for my premium content. Also, please, if you learned something today, take two seconds and hit that like button so that other people will be more likely to find this video as well. Today I'm going to talk to you about pregabalin, known by the brand name Lyrica and others. Generic preparations are available. Pregabalin is a glutamate and voltage-gated calcium channel blocker. I talk about blocking voltage-gated ion channels in my recent trileptal and lamictal videos. In those cases, it's chiefly sodium ion channels that are being blocked. In this case, we're talking about calcium. Lyrica is classified as an anticonvulsant used to prevent seizures in epilepsy and an antineuralgic to treat chronic pain. This is according to the Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, which has approved Lyrica for the treatment of diabetic peripheral neuropathy, both the immediate and controlled release preparations. Both the IR and CR formulations are likewise approved for the treatment of postherpetic neuralgia, which is a painful condition that sometimes develops following the shingles outbreak, characterized by persistent nerve pain, which is described as burning, aching, or shooting in the area where the shingles rash occurred, even after the rash is cleared. And this can be accompanied by sensitivity to touch, called allodynia, in which stimuli that are not normally painful induce a pain response. Lyrica is approved for treating fibromyalgia, but only the immediate release preparation. As a matter of fact, Lyrica was the first medication to be approved for the treatment of fibromyalgia, which, in my opinion, is really a wastebasket diagnosis. Fibromyalgia is a syndrome. You can learn more about that in my video on fibromyalgia. It's also proof for neuropathic pain associated with spinal cord injury, again, the IR, and the immediate release is also approved for the prevention of partial onset seizures in adults and pediatric patients ages one, one month and older, as well as adjunctively in combination with other agents for that indication. But Lyrica is also commonly prescribed off-label, that means without FDA approval, for peripheral neuropathic pain of all stripes, and of special interest to psychiatrists for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, and social anxiety disorder. Three endogenous major anxiety syndromes with considerable overlap in terms of epidemiology, if not exact symptomatology. That is, patients with one disorder often meet diagnostic criteria for one or another of the others. There's some evidence to support their use in these conditions, although the FDA hasn't looked at any research to officially sanction its use in those syndromes. There's also a unique and potentially very useful indication in chronic insomnia, especially that recalcitrant to more conventional treatments, which I discovered serendipitously in myself. I myself am prescribed Lyrica for neuropathic pain, and indeed, there does seem to be a niche for the treatment of insomnia, at least anecdotally. Please check out my Secret Power of Lyrica video for details about that, an excerpt from my longer Insomnia Armamentarium video that reviews all of the major classes of agents we use to treat insomnia and how that contributes to Lyrica's efficacy in all of the above mentioned realms as an anticonvulsant in the treatment of neuropathy and off-label to treat anxiety and insomnia. Just briefly, Pregabalin is an analog of the essential amino acid leucine, which means they share chemical structure. It binds the alpha-2 delta subunit of voltage-sensitive calcium channels, which diminishes excessive neuronal activity and neurotransmitter release, especially glutamate, the major excitatory neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Although pregabalin also is structurally related to gamma-aminobutyric acid, GABA, the body's major inhibitory neurotransmitter, Lyrica has no known direct actions on GABA receptors or GABA itself. So, it's supplied in capsules in denominations ranging from 25 to 300 milligrams, a 20 milligram per cc oral solution for ease of administration in children and others with difficulty swallowing pills, and extended release tablets in 82.5, 165, and 330 milligram denominations. Kind of weird denominations there. The usual dosing range is between 150 and 600 milligrams a day in two to three divided doses if you're using the IR preparation, the immediate release. 
or up to 660 milligrams once a day of the CR, which would be two capsules. You're not supposed to break open the capsule that corrupts the extended release property of the formulation. Post-tropetic neuralgia, which can be very painful, might require higher dosing than diabetic peripheral neuropathy or fibromyalgia, keeping in mind that fibromyalgia is an off-label indication. Fibromyalgia is a nebulous collection of multifactorial syndromes whose psychosomatic nature is probably the one thing they all have in common. Psychosomatic meaning caused or aggravated by psychological factors and stress, not false or imaginary. And the implication of that for me is that we wouldn't want to ignore those other variables and we wouldn't want to be overzealous with medication. We really need to attend to all of those other psychosocial and psychological variables. Pregabalin is also structurally related to gabapentin, neurontin, which also binds to the alpha-2 delta subunit of voltage-gated calcium channels in the brain. Both belong to the gabapentinoid class of drugs. Both are used to treat diabetic peripheral neuropathy and post neuralgia, and both are likewise approved as adjunct therapy for partial onset seizures. So in as much as they share the same mechanism of action and they're approved for the same conditions, they're often compared. And I'm gonna do a separate video on this. Pregabalin is more potent and clinically more effective than gabapentin, at least as an analgesic. This is the common wisdom and I certainly have experienced that myself. I've been prescribed both and there was a clear difference between them when I switched back and forth. Initially prescribed Lyrica, I switched due to extreme sedation which really limits pregabalin's use for a lot of patients, at least initially. Tolerance is eventually developed to this side effect, but it's also one of the main reasons Lyrica can be abused. It's classified as a Schedule V controlled substance. At starting doses of Lyrica, I was falling asleep while sitting up, dozing in my chair, which I've never done. But when I was switched at my own behest to Neurontin, the pain got significantly worse, even at the highest doses. I was able to be switched back eventually and was titrated to the maximum dose of Lyrica with minimal sedation during the day after developing some tolerance and also after I started taking bupropion to combat the sedation. And that strategy works great with all sedating psychotropic medications, along with staying active and avoiding recumbency. But although Lyrica occasionally continues to make me unacceptably sleepy when I'm on the couch trying to relax and watch a little TV, it has also cured a lifetime of initial insomnia, trouble falling asleep due to an inability to stop thinking. I also suffer from OCD and I've never been able to shut my mind off at night efficiently enough to get to sleep in less than an hour. I used to lie in bed awake at night for up to two hours as a kid, not necessarily worrying, but just thinking and thinking and thinking. And then presto, Overnight, in my 50s, I'm suddenly able to get to sleep within 10 minutes of my head hitting the pillow, night after night, because of the Lyrica. I'm not aware of any time passing between laying my head down and falling asleep. I only estimate around 10 minutes because the device I wear tells me. But in my subjective experience, sleep latency, the time it takes to fall asleep, is essentially zero minutes. But I wonder if I don't have a little retrograde amnesia for that. It wouldn't surprise me. Anyway, I've used adjunctive Lyrica, Lyrica added to a conventional sleep agent in my patients with chronic recalcitrant insomnia with good success. I don't even take it with a separate sleeping pill. All by itself, it has cured a lifetime of initial insomnia. But if it's not contraindicated, I encourage you providers and training out there to try it in your severe insomnia patients with the caveat that combining Lyrica with other sedatives must be carried out responsibly and precisely as directed. Depressive effects, including respiratory depression, can be increased by combining Lyrica with other CNS depressants, such as opioids, benzodiazepines, alcohol, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, other anticonvulsants, and other sedating medication. But it can be carefully combined with other sedatives by an expert in a responsible patient. No fatalities have been reported in overdose with just Lyrica. As far as other drug-drug interactions, pregabalin has not been shown to have significant pharmacokinetic drug interactions. 98% of it is excreted unchanged by the kidneys. And so it really just doesn't interact with other molecular species, which is a huge plus. Also, Lyrica improves slow-wave delta sleep. And although it has to be dosed throughout the day for epilepsy and pain, one of its major disadvantages, to improve deep sleep, we may only need to take pregabalin at bedtime. 
I actually recommend taking it an hour or two before bedtime, which I never do. Lyrica is the only sedative for insomnia that I don't recommend taking as one is actually getting into bed. I make a big deal with my patients about good sleep hygiene and how to responsibly take their medication because most of them are habit forming, which means you're going to develop tolerance. And that means the patient will come back and say it's not working anymore. But a mistake they often make is they take it way before bedtime and then they're doing stuff and they're waiting to feel sleepy or maybe they want to feel the effects of the medicine. They want to relax a little bit before they get into bed, but that's a mistake. If you have bad insomnia and you're trying to make your sleeping pill last and try to preserve the efficacy of that pill, then you need to take it as you're getting into bed practically. You take it and then don't go brush your teeth and check your email, get into bed. And don't be looking at screens, good sleep hygiene, be ready within 10 or 20 minutes on an empty stomach to roll over, hug your pillow in a cool, dark, quiet room so that that medication can relax you and help you get to sleep, to facilitate that. And it will always do that if you take it right, if you don't expect it to knock you out like it did the first time you took it because you're gonna develop tolerance and then we can't increase the dose forever. But Lyrica is the exception. With Lyrica, the sedation seems to be delayed. So an hour or two before bedtime, and then I often combine it with another sleeping medication at bedtime, and that combination is just magic for a lot of my patients. Lyrica can be taken with or without food. Pregabalin is absorbed faster and more completely than gabapentin, which might also explain its superior efficacy. It's safe for long-term use, and the reference I use claims that Lyrica is not habit-forming. However, withdrawal is possible. I myself take a high dose and have experienced sweating and headaches. And while discontinuation symptoms are uncommon, patients with epilepsy can seize upon abrupt withdrawal. So Lyrica should always be tapered over about a week, depending on the dose. Rebound insomnia and anxiety are also at least theoretically possible with abrupt discontinuation. Notable side effects include especially sedation. For intolerable sedation with the immediate release formulation, we can give most of the dose at night and less during the day, or try the extended release. Intolerable sedation is right. I'm telling you, I had to move away from it because I was falling asleep in my chair in group therapy in rehab when I was in rehab and we would be in this big group and things would get quiet or we were like not waiting and I would start to almost slump over and then I'd come to, it was crazy. And it was so bad that I told them, take me off of it, you know, but then later, I was able to take it with Welbutrin with really, really good effects. And then the Welbutrin I noticed was helping my motivation and helping my energy level and my mood overall. So even now I've developed a lot of tolerance, I think, to the Lyrica, to the sedation, but the bupropion is still a nice add-on in my case. Sedation is dose-related, but significant tolerance can develop over time. Beyond sedation, fatigue is possible and dizziness, as well as impaired attention and confusion but that would indicate that the dose is probably too high. I myself experience cognitive side effects on higher doses, and I just did a video on that. So please check out cognitive dulling. This could include memory impairment. Dry mouth is possible. And I'll tell you about the dry mouth. I usually cut that out, but I'll tell you about the dry mouth with Lyrica. It's really annoying because with other medications that cause dry mouth, and I've, I've taken a lot of medications that cause dry mouth, well, butrin and among them, you get a really dry mouth. Your mucous membranes and your tongue so dry that your lips are sticking together. You gotta go get a drink of water. Lyrica, it dries out your saliva, but it does so less. And so what ends up happening, you are producing saliva. It's just, it just doesn't have as much water in it. It's more viscous. It's like a gel. And that's what happens after a minute or so, this gel is on your tongue. And it's not just naturally being washed away with just regular swallows. You have to like swallow it, this is gross, but yeah, you have to like clear it because it's more viscous. It's really annoying. So I usually cut this part out, but Lyrica does dry out your mouth. I wish it dried my mouth out more because of this. And other people may experience different levels of dryness. This is my own personal anecdotal experience with Lyrica. Other possible side effects, uh, most of these I don't get, by the way, and most of these people wouldn't get, but these are all the possible ones. Constipation, blurred vision, tremor, dysarthria. Please watch the cognitive dulling video, the last one I just released right before this one. I talk about how I had dysarthria on Lyrica. I had trouble saying words, but only in Spanish. And so it's really fascinating. Paresthesias are also possible. Those are abnormal neurological sensations like tingling, 
ataxia, which is muscular incoordination. I also had that. And double vision, diplopia. They're all possible. But it, these are all dose dependent. So you just got to modulate the dose if you're getting these neurological side effects. Vomiting, increased appetite and weight gain, and flatulence have been reported, as well as sexual dysfunction, decreased libido, and varying degrees of erectile dysfunction and anorgasmia. Beyond a potential anxiolytic effect for some patients, others have experienced a euphoric mood. Another reason Lyrica can be taken recreationally by some patients. It is classified as a Schedule V controlled substance, so it can be abused. This is a side effect, folks. No matter how much the patient may like and welcome it, it's a controlled substance, but medications in Schedule 5, there are five schedules, are considered to be among those with the least abuse potential. And refills are allowed, meaning you don't need a new prescription every time you visit the pharmacy. Conversely, irritability has also been reported as a side effect, so anything's possible when you're talking about psychotropic effects. It's important to emphasize that the safety and efficacy of Lyrica have not been established in mental illness diagnoses, all used by psychiatry in the United States, is off-label, which also doesn't mean it doesn't work. It certainly appears to, at least in some patients. We can't really say most. We don't have the data. However, Lyrica is approved for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder in Europe, so the European agencies have the data. It's not approved for fibromyalgia in Europe. So obviously, it doesn't mean that it works over there for anxiety, and then you get on a plane, come over here, and it stops working, right? Those are just administrative approvals and they're important the protocols are important to make sure that medications are number one safe and number two that there's evidence that they work so we don't get any snake oil so how long does it take to work generally within a week for pain and anxiety with seizures coming under control by about two weeks on the long end of the spectrum we might have to wait as long as six to eight weeks before we see significant improvement in some patients but if we don't have acceptable efficacy by two months, after titrating the dosage to the maximum tolerated recommended dose, we may need to look elsewhere for pharmacologic relief. And especially if we're treating fibromyalgia, don't forget those psychological and psychosocial variables and the other comorbid conditions like irritable bowel syndrome and headaches, migraines, insomnia that may be exacerbating pain as well, and the mood. At the end of the day, Lyrica may work best as an adjunct, an add-on. As far as pain, Lyrica was one of the first treatments approved for pain associated with diabetic peripheral neuropathy, but neuropathic pain can be stubborn, and many patients have only a partial response, while others, a significant subset, simply fail to respond, unfortunately. Lyrica, for me, it does absolutely greatly diminish pain, and depending on how bad my pain is and how much I take, I can be pain-free for a couple of hours, maybe and then I've got to stand up and I can alleviate the pain. But it doesn't take it away 100% sometimes. Sometimes when I'm, I have a flare up, and I'm just, my nerves are just, a lot of times I feel like with neuropathic pain, like once the nerves are jangled, once they're irritated and the pain has started, because the whole problem is the nerves themselves are damaged, the nerves themselves are propagating these pain signals unnecessarily. And so you're getting pain when you're not doing anything that should be hurting. It's the nerves themselves are hurting. In my experience, it feels like once it gets started, then if you then take medication, you're chasing the symptom, you're not going to get the same efficacy as if you prophylax, if you take the dose before you anticipate the symptom. So that's been my experience. It's my anecdotal experience. So disclaimer, I'm not saying that's how it works, but it certainly seems to be the case for me. So that is Lyrica in a nutshell. Thank you for watching. Be sure to check out The Secret Power of Lyrica to hear a little bit more about my use of that medication for insomnia, for the treatment of insomnia. As always, questions and comments are welcome.